Join Grammy-winning Pacific Coral on October 7th for a spectacular evening of music and film at Cedar Storm Center for the Arts in Costa Mesa. Experience Richard Ironhorn's evocative Voices of Light, sung live with an orchestra to the silent film The Passion of Joan of Arc, considered by many one of the greatest films ever made. Visit pacificchoral.org to learn more. Welcome to J Life with Daniel. I'm your host, Rabbi Daniel Levine. Okay, well, today we have a special guest. I am here with Maggie Anton, the writer of the acclaimed series, Rashi's Daughters. And this is really a series, I think it came out about 15 or 16 years ago, and it really is one of the staples on any Jewish bookshelf. So uh, Maggie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I just realized actually it came out 18 years ago. Eight years ago. Oh nice my Jewish number. Exactly. Um, well, a uh, happy, happy Chai anniversary. That's that's yeah, Rashi's daughters. Yeah. Um, so let's let's start with Rashi. Our, our listeners may or may not be familiar with him. He, of course, was was an 11th century French sage, probably most known for his extensive commentary both on the Torah and Tanakh, and also the Talmud. But why Rashi? How did Rashi fall into your lap, and where did you get the idea to write about his three daughters? Okay. Um, in 1992, I heard about a woman's Talmud class being taught by Rachel Adler. Um, that was so long ago that she wasn't a rabbi yet <laughs> and she didn't have her PhD yet. But, um, if you've ever studied with her, you can imagine why she started a woman's Talmud class because let's face it, there was, well, there was Drisha in New York. But there wasn't any place in Los Angeles or Southern California or the Western part of the United States where a woman could study Talmud. And so she started this class. We met around her dining table and I somehow heard about it and I signed up for it. And I admit um, I had some basic Jewish knowledge, but of course I had never, I had never studied Talmud in any depth. And in those days, the only English translation was Sansino, which was kind of schwach. Yes. So I heard of it, you know, I said of this class, let's face it, all you have to do is forbid something and it immediately becomes more attractive. Mm. And I had also heard that Rachel had, you know, I mean, I knew she had this great reputation as a teacher. And sometimes if the teacher is great, you sign up for their class and you don't care what the class is. You're, you just want to learn from them. So um, it was... It was a shock to me when I got to her house and sitting around the table, everyone except me was a ra was a woman rabbi, a rabbinic student. I was so out of my depth. And we're reading, um, we're using the, um, oh, what's his name? Let me look. <laughs> Not Sansino, definitely. Is it uh, Steinsaltz? Yeah, we're using Steinsaltz. Um, you know, the Hebrew version. And thankfully we spoke in English. So once we translated that, I could, and besides, I mean, if you study Talmud at all, you know, you can spend like an hour on three sentences. Yes. So I didn't have problems with, with that, but being in a woman's talk, you know, almost immediately you're introduced to Rashi. He's on every page, almost every line. And Raquel points out that Rashi had no sons, only daughters, daughters reputed to be learned. And my kids were, you know, leaving the nest. My husband had commute was getting longer and longer. I had a lot of free time on my hands. And the more, you know, that we were studying here and, you know, going into Rashi, I began wondering like, what's with the daughters? Did he really have three daughters? Were they really learned? And so I decided in my spare time to, to look into this. Okay. Living in Los Angeles, we got three rabbinic schools with their Judaic libraries. We've got UCLA, USC, Claremont colleges. They have all kinds of theological stuff there. And I started doing research. And the first place I looked was um, an ancient version of Encyclopedia Judaica at my, which is in my, which was in my synagogue's library. And the synagogue was formed in 1926, and that's probably when, when that version came out. Got it. And I'm looking at it, 
Um, and what gave me the idea that I could do this kind of research was that the during the time when Roots was a big sensation on television, a lot of people got into genealogy and I did as well. And I learned a lot of techniques on how to do family histories. And um, I had never done anything back to the Middle Ages. Anyway, so I uh, started, I opened up Encyclopedia Judaica and of course, you know, there's article on Rashi and they had a nice little family tree that I looked at and immediately realized was wrong. Hmm. Because um, the number of daughters was correct and the number of grandsons was correct, but the order in which they came was clearly not uh, correct. The, uh, the person who wrote the article um, had, instead of Rabbeinu Tom being the last grandson, he had uh, Rashi's grandson, Shlomo, being the last grandson born after Rashi died. Well, the mother of Shlomo was the oldest daughter. And if, and okay, Rashi died in, um, let's see, he was born in 1040, died in 1106. We're actually coming up on Rashi's 1000th birthday. I may live so long. You probably will. Hopefully I will too. And there better be a better. It's going to be, be a, uh, you know, we're going to have to find a cake big enough for a thousand uh, candles there. It's going to be a. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Quite, yeah. quite the job. Right, or even a hundred big fat ones. But yeah, that's coming up. Anyway, so I figured out, okay, if Yohevit was the oldest and she would have been born in like 1060 something, then she did no way she had a child after 11 O's. Six, you know, when Rashi died. I mean, I'm sorry. You know, one of the things you learn in genealogy is that women don't have children in their 50s, especially in those days. And I did a little more research, and sure enough, you know, Rabbeinu Tom was Rashi's youngest grandson. That was documented in a lot of places, and it was also documented that he was born in 1095. Got Which, it. And just to, sorry to pause you, just to paint our readers a little bit more of a picture for those who aren't familiar with sort of the great Ashkenazi uh, rabbi. So we, we've introduced Rashi already, French French rabbi, founded a yeshiva, known for really pulling all the, the best and brightest in the Ashkenazi world. So really, we're talking about uh, France and Germany, maybe some scholars. Yeah, most of them are his relatives. Yes, exactly. And then his, through his three daughters, really the entire Ashkenazi oh medieval right. world, you know, was was their offspring, especially the uh, school of the Tosafists, of which Rabbeinu Tam, Rashi's grandson, was was the most famous. So we're not just really talking about one person with Rashi, we're really talking about... Oh, yeah, a whole... Uh, yeah, the, the two yeshivas, because Rabbeinu Tam and his brother each formed their own. Um, anyway, so as soon as I realized, wait, that's wrong. And then I thought, okay, what else was wrong? What's what is the real, I didn't know what was the right thing, but I knew that that was wrong. So that's what propelled me into uh, doing more research about Rashi's family, where there really only three daughters. No, there were four daughters. Only the fourth daughter was um, um, controversial, whether they had, you know, I have to argue over whether which children were whose. And so once I had gotten further into learning about Rashi's family, I, was learning also about the um, the Jewish community that his family was a part of, that he wasn't really the leader of, but he was the guy who ran the yeshiva, which was not what we would consider a yeshiva. It was like a bunch of um, 10 year old kids mm, from yeah. the neighborhood came to his house and, and learned. And I know all of this stuff because of Chuvo Rashi and various, you know, things that people wrote um, at the time. So I, you know, I actually have first, um, you know, primary sources. Um, I'll take a slight segue. Rashi wrote his commentaries during what's called the 12th century Renaissance, which nobody has heard of, except the scholars of that time period. Everybody just thinks of 
the Renaissance, which is actually the 15th century Italian Renaissance. But during the 12th century Renaissance, it wasn't limited just to Italy. It was in the Christian world, the Muslim world, the Jewish world. And we think of it as um, like the, the golden age of Spain starts the 12th century Renaissance. And you have all these Muslim Jewish scholars who are, are dealing with each other in Spain. And then the, I don't, I don't even, we don't even know who in the Christian world who are only reading Latin discover, oh, there's a lot of Greek stuff, you know, by Ptolemy, by um, trying to think who's the one who, who writes about the soul. Um, one of the Greek Plinus, maybe. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, and then meanwhile, people. in the uh, Muslim lands, they're inventing algebra and, and astronomy and, and all that kind of stuff. And the Christians suddenly become aware that there is all of this scholarly material out there, some of which, like, uh, you know, the treatise on the soul, um, they would really like to read, but they can't read uh, those languages. And so they turn to the Jews, who of course can read and talk all of them. That's, that's what they do. So they hired or somehow um, insisted that uh, these Jewish scholars translate the Muslim texts, the Greek texts, and uh, translate them into Latin. And then you start, once these get into Latin, then you have all the Christian scholars doing, writing what they're writing and new translations of the Torah. Oh, by the way, the King James version of, you know, the English, you know, the people kind of poo poo and other than, oh, it's so nice and poetic. Yeah. The, the guy who wrote that worked with Rashi on the translation. So it's the closest, uh, certainly medieval or ancient Christian Bible that is the most accurate. And, you know, Rashi had, had, a, had a hand in that. His, his oldest son actually studied with Christians in Paris at their, um, um, Heloise and Abelard, studied, he studied with Abelard. And because a lot, they, it's like suddenly the Christians woke up and said, God did not give the Bible in Latin. Yes. We're not sure if the translation we have is what God really gave. Yeah. Well, the Middle Ages in the Ashkenazi world is fascinating because you have these sort of, the sort of roller coaster, really, when it comes to Jewish Christian relations. Obviously, just to paint the picture for, for the listeners, medieval. Europe was was under Christendom, aside from Spain and Portugal, would eventually, you know, the South would become part of uh, the Christian world. But really, when we're talking 11th and 12th century, we're talking about France, and we're talking about England, and we're talking about Germany. And there were, of course, times of relative peace and, and ecumenicism and, you know, working between Jewish and Christian scholars. Yeah. Generally, historically, right, the medieval Ashkenazi period is actually not known for its you know, shall we say, interfaith relations, generally the story of medieval Ashkenazi Jewry is one of uh, anti-Semitic persecution, which which Rashi also, of course, dealt with, right? The last 10 years of his life were in the wake of the uh, First Crusades. And one of the interesting things about Rashi, and then I do want to get to his uh, daughters, who I think are the more interesting, yes, at least this conversation, but actually a lot of material from the Ashkenazi rabbinic tradition only survived because of Rashi's writings. And you had you know, all of these different schools in Germany and in France and, you know, these all these biblical commentative traditions that had been, you know, really growing for three, four hundred years. And they were all in one way or another destroyed. There were, you know, we know there were several book burnings, uh, both the Talmud and other rabbinic materials in, in Paris in the 1200s and other places would follow suit. And so Rashi really saves us in a number of ways. He preserves this you know, medieval Ashkenazi tradition, he allows, you know, 
the simple person, you know, I'm including myself, of course, in the simple people, it allows us to actually read the Talmud without, you know, breaking our neck over it. Um, one other just interesting Rashi fact, and then we'll get to his daughter, is, is also for scholars of, of the French language, Rashi is also yeah. one of the only people who actually wrote in old French, right? It was, of course, the spoken language in France in the middle medieval ages. But today, if you were getting a PhD in French literature or in the history of... Oh, you'd be a great Talmud scholar. Yes, exactly. out all those French words. Yeah, and, and I remember just jokingly. So, of course, you know, growing up in, uh, you know, Jewish day school in yeshiva, you know, we would study both uh, Torah and Talmud, you know, on the daily. And so Rashi was, you know, I, I sort of always felt like I knew him growing up. But then every once in a while, Rashi would you know, interpret some word in the Torah that we were struggling over with some ancient French word as if that helped. And so I remember, you know, we would always look at each other and be like, well, that's that's even harder. Um, so, but Barashi, of course, is a, you know, probably the towering figure when you think of uh, medieval Ashkenazis. Um, so let's let's drop down to his daughters. Um, and really, well, before going to his daughters, just the general question, there are, to the best of my knowledge, two scholars who focus on medieval Jewish women in the Ashkenazi world, um, Abraham Grossman and right. Elisheba Baumgarten, who have both right. you know, written extensively. They mostly agree. There's obviously some interesting debates there, but um, you have put together an extensive bibliography. For <laughs> There's over, over 400 sources. Yeah, I was shocked. On, my web, on the, the website. So usually, I, usually I, I would think, and I've read, you know, historical fiction is one of my favorite uh, types of novels. And so I read a lot of it. And a lot of times I'm always curious, you know, how accurately is this represented? So usually I figure the average novelist of historical fiction reads one or two books and then, you know, paints a whole world based off of that. You read about 500 books and then tried to narrow it down. Um, but what do we know about medieval women in, in the Ashkenazi world? And how do we know anything about them, given that I don't believe we have any written material from them? We do have written materials because we have Chuvot Rashi and we have the, in the 12th, one of the things that happened in 12th century Renaissance is people started writing things down. And not that all of it has been found, but, but there's a lot. And so that we know, and also from, from Rashi's commentary, because he throws in stuff about his family and 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 because he's talking, especially and the Tosafot throw in all kinds of stuff about their their families. If, yeah, I, uh, I admit that we don't have actually any sources written from from women. It's sort of always filtered through, you know, male rabbinic writings. Right. Maybe, maybe. There's there's actually some indication that some of Rashi's response, uh, oh no, no question about it, for sure. Some of Rashi's responsa was written by his daughters towards the end of his life when when he had what we could recognize as modern people, he had a stroke. Yeah. So he could communicate with them and they would write it down is what what it says. But of course, what really happened is that he was completely incapacitated and his daughters had already been writing down his responsa to send it to people. They were like his secretary. And to, towards the end of the life, his life, they're just answering the responsa. Um, and scholars can tell the way it's written that it's not him. And even more so, his uh, his commentary on his Talmud commentary on Nedarim, I believe, is strangely enough, it says attributed to Rashi. Whereas we have places in the Talmud where it's definitely written by a grandson, it's mm -hmm. written by a son-in-law, and, and I'm looking at that, and, and me and my study partner, who's the Orthodox rabbi, um, there's no way that they didn't know who wrote this. This is a commentary, an entire tractate of Talmud. It didn't, it wasn't anonymous. They, they know it's not Rashi and they should have known who did it. And, you know, he was looking at it and saying, you know, this actually sounds kind of feminine. Um, and we came to the conclusion, but others have as well, that this was written by one or maybe several of Rashi's daughters. And of course they couldn't attribute it to them. So it became anonymous. Got it. Uh, and the 
the style of the writing is it's certainly not Rashi's and it's not Rabbeinu Tom's and it's not it you know anybody who we know wrote Rashi's yeah I think I think traditionally in the orthodox world and you know this is of course a non-academic statement but it's attributed to the Rashbam right his other grandson uh Shmuel but but yes no that that, that yeah. is an so anyway that's it's it's definitely but anyway so there's so the Tosafot do talk about their mothers and we have um um there's a, a volume that is not readily accessible um the Machsor Vitri which is a compendium of of laws and commentary and gossip compiled by Rashi's uh um disciples and actually um i i had a copy of it i i later it's it's in hebrew and we translated it oh, wow. um so i don't need the original anymore so but that really talks about that i mean from there i know that women had that in rashi's community women had aliyah to the torah i was too chicken to put that in my in the books i didn't i already got enough aggravation emails accusing me of making up stuff accuse me of getting the halakha wrong excuse me rashi did not put aluminum foil on his countertops during pesach and <laughs> the most obvious kinds of halakha back then was very different it was much more lenient you had merchants who had to eat in any uh you know in that they came to and if they were lucky, they could have fish, but there were certainly no kosher dishes. Um, yeah. No, it's always it's always a fascinating point in terms of the development of halakha Jewish law, because, you know, just growing up as a student of the Talmud, you read, especially with uh, kashrut, right, the laws of Jewish hari, uh, diet, you read these cases in the Talmud of these Babylonian rabbis that are asking, if you have an oven and there's a pork roast in there and a kosher <laughs> meat, can you eat the meat? And half of them say, of course you can eat the meat. And today, you know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, stringency on a stringency on a stringency. Um, zo zooming, zooming back out a little bit. So, so we know that. Anyway, so we, anyway, we know from his response uh, that, that, you know, the, that he collected or who knows who collected. Um, as I said, we know women had aliyah to the Torah. Um, and frankly, according to the Talmud, anybody can have aliyah to the Torah if they know Hebrew. And Hebrew was the language of merchants. Yes, mostly they were Jewish, but even the non-Jewish merchants had to know Hebrew for their accounts because Hebrew decimal is a decimal system and nobody wanted to use Roman numerals. Mm -hmm. So accounts, and also it was a way of keeping it secret because you had to know these, this esoteric number system to do that. But anyway, so we knew that women blew the shofar because there was a, response to debate, you know, about women blowing the shofar. Um, we know that, um, we know that women wore tzitzit. Um, everybody, every Jew wore tzitzit because there wasn't a, the tal, a talit was, is, you know, the Aramaic is cloak. And that's all they were is cloaks. They weren't religious garments at that time. If you go back, you know, and I can go back, there's plenty of illustrations in medieval manuscripts. And you see a room full of men in a synagogue praying, and only the leader at the front is wearing a talit. So you know that none of you know they weren't. And actually, there's a response from Rashi in which somebody wanted to be buried with seat seat, and Rashi says he never wore them during his lifetime. Why shouldn't he be buried with them? <laughs> um, anyway, so we know that every, all the all the Jews wore seat seat on their cloaks. And they hung by the door. There weren't men's, there weren't women. So women did that. Women, as I said, they had Haliyat to the Torah. They were counted in a minion, um, partly because the men are merchants. They're long distance. They're gone. You wouldn't necessarily always even have 10 guys there. But that wasn't any of their argument. They just counted women um, in there. As I said, women lose the shofar. Um, pretty much every one of the men's mitzvot, women certainly sat in the sukkahs they did um all the time bound positive bits vote yeah and we know that because they argue about it and there were women Mo mohelet who i mean i had miriam be a, a, a midwife and a mohelet 
but there were because we have actually in Rashi's tshuva where the men, some of the men are arguing that women should not be doing this. And it's pretty hard to, to argue against the Torah where Moses's wife circumcises their sons. Uh, I mean, I've seen Orthodox responses where they try and, and get around that so that uh, only men can do circumcisions. But women were doing them uh, back then. And interestingly, they used the same like healing herbs and whatever that they might use in childbirth for, uh, for circumcision. So anyway, so it pretty much, I had first, not first person, I had primary sources. That's the thing about the 12th century, we start having stuff written down. So whereas in the eighth century, no, you don't know what anybody's doing because there's no written record of it. And the Talmud has not been written down as far as, we, we haven't found much in terms of the Talmud until you get to the 12th century. And actually, Rashi very secretly wrote his commentary with, because, and taught his, teaching his daughters was no big deal. What he was really worried about was them fight, was having the authorities find out that he was writing down the Tal Talmud, which was supposed to be only oral. And you're absolutely right. If it wasn't for Rashi, we wouldn't have the Talmud anymore. Because he's the one that was writing, you know, uh, writing it down. And then after all the other yeshivot, um, I think there were five or six at the during Rashi's lifetime, and every one of them except his uh, disappeared for, I mean, not because they were destroyed from anti-Semitism. The, the yeshivot in Morocco and in Spain were caught in the crossfires of the Christian Muslim wars or the Muslim Muslim wars, you know, the Berbers versus whoever the other ones were. Yeah. And in a very sad situation for the the two yeshiva that were left in Bavel and in um, Israel were supported by the outside communities. And there was, I don't know what year it was, but it's not hard to find. There was an argument over the calendar. Yes. This Just is like there had been between Israel and Babylonia since whatever. But anyway, there was an argument over the calendar and they couldn't, uh, they ended up not agreeing on what, what it was. And they were a month apart for Yom Kippur. And the diaspora is going, these guys cannot decide what day Yom Kippur is. I'm not sending any money to their yeshiva anymore. We'll, you know, we got calendars here. We can see a new moon and we'll, We'll figure it out ourselves. Yeah, all, and, all this is really opening up a history book to realize that this is not the first time in Jewish history that the uh, is Israel community and the diaspora have, uh, you know, fights over all, all sorts of ideological issues. Um, yeah, I believe the calendar dispute was earlier. That might be the 10th. Oh, century. yeah, no, that calendar here. But they still had, it's, they still disputed, even though they theoretically already knew um, when it was. And it's a sorry commentary on Judaism that, it destroyed, you know, those yeshivas disappeared. And Rashi's little yeshiva in Twa, um, and then later his, uh, Rabbeinu Tom had his own in Ramaru. Those were what kept Talmud available and alive, you know, for later. And, yeah. they, and, and with the yeshivas gone, nobody could study it right. And so you started having all these guys writing codes. Maimonides was actually excommunicated for <laughs> for writing Mishnah Torah. But anyway, so I knew from all the responsa, and I must admit, I already had finished writing Rashi's Daughters when Baumgarten and, um, uh, and anyway, the other one who wrote that they, both of those books came out very close together about Jewish women in medieval times. And it was very close to when I had you know, Rashi's daughters came out. So part of me was really, you know, those came out as like, oh my God, I'm going to find out that everything I did, you know, my research was wrong and I didn't know what I was doing. But it turns out we used the same sources. And so I, I gave a big sigh of relief. 
Yeah, it's incredible. Just just a couple of things to to flag there for for listeners. I mean, a lot of you know, so there were these infamous book burnings that happened all throughout the Ashkenazi world, usually by Christian authorities, and especially the the Talmud was singled out for a unique ire because you know there were all sorts of debates that actually the Christian authorities would make Jews engage in to try to disprove you know a whole host of things. Probably the most famous one is Nachmanides in Spain, you know, in in Barcelona, the the disputation. But when these debates would end, there would be these mass book burnings. You know, today in 2023, obviously book burnings are still bad, but we have backups of things, right? So if somebody burns a thousand copies of the Talmud today, it's still a tragedy in some sense, but we can go to the printer and print out a hundred <laughs> more or, or open our phone and open up Sepharia. When the Talmud was burned in the medieval Ashkenazi community, that really was the end of access to all of this information, you know, possibly for all of the Jews of Ashkenaz. And so these are, you know, much bigger deals than just the symbolism of a book burning. It really was the decimation of a whole host of uh, information. And I wanted to yeah, find- This is way after Rashi's time. Yes. Um, because there's no books to burn until you have the printing press. And interestingly, the very first book, Hebrew book printed in a printing press in like 1500, I mean, hot off the presses. They there were hardly any presses there, and this one was in Venice. Was not only, of course, it's going to be the Torah, but it was the Torah with Rashi's commentary, and that's where Rashi script came from. Rashi didn't write Rashi script. He couldn't. He wouldn't know what it was if he saw it. But the um, the printer had to come up with a different what we would call font mm -hmm. in in printing the Torah to separate what was actually the Torah. And that was the block letters that were block Hebrew we're familiar with. And then when it came time to, to put Rashi in there, uh, he had to create a new font and being um, thrifty fellow, he used the font that used the least ink. Ink mm. was really, as you read my book, ink is really expensive in those days, how they made it. And so he used the font that was the most economical. And now we're stuck with Rashi script not only for Rashi, but all kinds of Jewish sources use it for the side notes or yeah. and for, for, for listeners who are not aware of what Rashi script is, oh, yeah. Rashi is printed in a script that is close-ish to, but not exactly the same as Hebrew. So about half the letters are different. So one of the things that you know, typically in, in early yeshiva days, I think I was, you know, seven or eight when I learned it, you basically have to learn Hebrew and then you have to learn a second language that is Hebrew, but with completely different letters. And it is, you know, much to the chagrin of uh, the young, uh, both uh, Chumash Torah scholar and also a uh, Talmudic scholar. Yeah, Just it's like, it's the, like handwriting or shorthand or not shorthand because all the letters are in there. It's like, trying it, to read it's like handwriting. Here. You know, you're trying to read ancient doctor's notes, you know, you're like, what is he saying? Uh, <laughs> right, right. Um, so just to just to fill in a little bit of the history, and then we'll go backwards, you know, and narrow in on Rashi's daughters. For the listeners, hearing you talk about the 11th and 12th century as times of, you know, more gender egalitarianism, even though probably nobody in the 12th century would say it like that, and they're wondering what <laughs> Definitely not. In the late 12th and 13th century, as a result of increased persecution in the Ashkenazi world, uh, different pietist movements arose in the Ashkenazi community that stressed a whole host of, you know, extreme pietistic and ascetic. Purity and impurity. and Yeah, and purity and impurity. And we know who's the impure ones. <laughs> exactly. and, and that really, and at least for the Ashkenazi world, that really, I think, set back a lot of the, the gender... Oh, absolutely. Um, egalitarianism because of a lot of these pietist movements that were historically brought upon by, you know, Christian dumb anti-Semitism. So just to paint a picture for the listeners of how complicated the uh, medieval world was. Um, so just going going back to the, uh, the the Rashi's daughter series. So you've, you know, you, you wrote a, you know, fantastic historical novel slash fictional work of Rashi's three daughters. And they're really, you know, growing up, both scholars and also trying to navigate the world in terms of both dating and marriage and finding a job and, and everything like that for the parts that, that didn't come out in research. So for the more creative aspects, how did you- Oh, the sex scenes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah, there's also a bunch of sex scenes, which I'm sure got you uh, some some fun uh, 
some fun fan mail from uh, people. Well, that and also some uh, scathing yes. uh, objections from uh, um, Orthodox women who, not having read anything by me before, assumed that this was more a pious history than um, yes. <laughs> than what I wrote. But exactly. They thought they were going to get. I wrote the years. book that I wanted to read, and that's that's why it's uh, it's like it is. Although I did chicken out, I did not put anything. I did not show women having aliyah in the Torah, in uh, in the book, and so I, I left out some of the more I won't say egregious, but what the ones that I knew would bring down the wrath, mm. and I got enough um, not hate mail, but just complaints that I got the halakha wrong, how dare I insult or impugn the holy you know, Rashi and his, his family. And after a while, I had like a stock email yeah. on, on, on that. And what I also got a lot of, which certainly has to do with Rashi's daughters, is the amazingly large number of people who think they are descendants of Rashi. Um, who didn't realize he had no sons. <laughs> you're, you're not descended that way, folks. But the what women were doing at that time was not just in the Jewish world. The Christian world also, you start having, like Heloise and, and Abelard, you start having great Christian women scholars. They're all in convents where the women had nothing, frankly, literally nothing better to do than study. The, the great Christian texts, which they did. And you also in the political world, women in the Christian world could be rulers under their own um, names. So you have, um, anyway, you have various women who, who ran their countries or their, uh, what we call it, counties, they're the countess or the duchess, the, the men were, were often fighting who knows who, each, usually each other. And that's actually how the first crusade, not that they called it the crusade, and they certainly didn't know that first that there were gonna be other ones. The Pope's idea, Pope came up with this idea that he would send, uh, he would call for a, a pilgrimage of, of armed guys to go and rescue uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Land from the infidels and this would keep them from fighting each other and there would be more peace in France. And he, a uh, big mistake, told them, if you go to the, the Holy Land and do this pilgrimage, you will go to heaven. Every sin that you ever committed will be forgiven. So you not only had these uh, warriors in the knights do it, but every kind of miscreant who had a lot of sins on his shoulders, decided to go too. And that's who does most of, at least the first, does all the horrible damage to, to the Jewish communities because they know oh, these guys are, are rich. I'll, uh, you know, as long as we're going nearby, why well, might as well stop in there? Um, and of course, most of them never made it to Jerusalem. Yeah. They, they got wiped out uh, when, they, when they hit Const Constantinople. But so you had women leadership as queens, as countesses, and people were used to having, you know, you know, you, you're run by the queen, you know, she's the one that makes the decisions. But, and you also had Christian women scholars in the convents and everybody is used to learned women in, in their society. So there wasn't, the um, misogyny, well, anyway, there, there were women in positions of power and knowledge that made it easier to have women in the Jewish community like, like that. Um, and that, I don't know, that, that changed later because they also, you know, the Christian world stopped letting the oldest daughter, you know, if there were, if there was no son, if, they would they would let the daughter become the queen or the daughter become the countess or the duchess and, and rule. They didn't um and that honestly I like to tell people 
I'm the world's expert on medieval Jewish Ashkenaz, you know, medieval Jewish women or medieval Jewish society between 1000 and 1200. Don't ask me about 1205. <laughs> I mean, I, I literally did not look at any of, of that. There's not much to look before 1000. Yeah. Well, also what, what happened, at least to the best of my knowledge of the medieval Jewish world, is because in the 1100s and 1200s, there was so much you know, entire cities of Jewish communities in the Ashkenazi world were wiped out. Most of the Jewish legal texts that survived were from the Sephardic world, which was down both in Spain and North Africa. And for all sorts of probably sociological and cultural reasons, right? When you read Maimonides' legal codes, who was, of course, right after Rashi, his view of female participation, shall we say, is a little bit more, um, you know... Well, the Muslim world that was how it was and in the uh you know the the christian world it it had there were more places for women mm -hmm. than in the muslim world so you know that's that but what what really um got you know apparently really really was bad for women thank you very much um shulchan aruch is that the superstitions and the fear that um, that men had of women menstruating, I mean, some of the responsa in there is like, it would curl your hair. I mean, that just stuff does not get reprinted. Nobody wants to talk about that anyway, and certainly not at that time. But, but they believed that the breath of a, of a Anida's breath mm. will contaminate you, that you can't walk, that you don't walk in her footsteps. And we're talking dirt roads, so there's there's certainly footsteps. And you gotta walk, that's why women are supposed to walk behind the men so that they can't, there's no footsteps for the men to step in and get uh, Tame um, impure. Rashi vigorously fights this. He um, this is a quote that, you know, I found, who knows where I found it in his works, that he's, he's really ticked off at all these pietists who are trying to exclude women from everything on account of Nida. And he says, Nida only affects a man and his wife. The Torah says you don't sleep with one, but all the other business <coughs> about Nida doesn't affect us today. We are all Tane Hamet which is a much worse impurity, the impurity of death. And there's no way you can get rid of it. We haven't had a red calf for who knows how long. And as soon as, you know, I try to explain to people, it's like cooties. If, if you have cooties and you touch someone, then they have cooties and then they touch someone. So they, there were no uh, Jewish mortuaries that prepared the dead. Everybody, every family prepared their own uh, relatives who died pretty much. So even, so of course you would get impure by death actually just touching your, a real corpse, but it wouldn't matter because somebody that you touched, that they touched it was impure. And Rashi says that um, we are all Tame Hamet. It doesn't matter in the synagogue. If the woman is accustomed to um, to making seat seat, to working on the uh, the cloaks and making the seat seat, um, she, she does it when she's need It doesn't matter if she's a company, if she's accustomed to repairing like the, um, the the robes and everything go over the the Torah, the Torah scroll or the ark, the curtains. If she does those kind of things, because most of the same sisters were women, it doesn't matter if she's need She can do it. It doesn't affect anything. And if she wants to go to synagogue, she goes to synagogue. If she's accustomed to going to synagogue, she goes to synagogue. If she's accustomed to holding holy objects or whatever, she, she does that. If she's accustomed to studying Torah, she does that. <laughs> and uh, this is a guy clearly does, you know, that has daughters. Uh, but he was really vehemently 
against restrictions on women because they might or might not be Nida. And apparently in his community, he, it was effective. But the, you know, the Shulchan Aruch, out of nowhere, there says women who are Nida are forbidden to go to the synagogue. Yeah, so just to, just to explain a little bit. So the Shulchan Arach, of course, wasn't written until the 16th century, but it was yeah. written by uh, Joseph Cairo, just for listeners that are, you know, hearing this word and, and don't know what it means. The Shulchan Arach was a compilation of all of really Sephardic Jewish law, and it was written at a time after the Spanish expulsion of the Jews in 1492. A lot of the uh, Sephardic Jewish community, especially the leadership, moved to the north of Israel to the beautiful town of Tzfat, where then, you know, both Kabbalah and also Jewish law was, was developed in fascinating ways there, probably for another podcast. But the, the book that um, is referring to is the Shulchan Aruch, which was written by Joseph Cairo, the leader of the community, where seemingly out of nowhere, he takes a much stricter uh, turn. Yes. On, uh, well, all the codes that got written after the yeshiva disappeared and nobody could actually study Talmud anymore, there was a bunch of codes. Um, and I think, as I said, Maimonides was excommunicated for writing his, because they had to get this down to like one volume, even if it was a fat one. So they, wherever the Talmud has a difference of opinion, where the argument ends, take who, you know, this one and this one are both, you know, the lenient, here's the strict, you do what you, you can do. Both of these are the words of God, and you follow which one you like. When they did the codes, they used only the strict ones. You ended up with like... And because they were printed, they were distributed every place. And the Shulchan Aruch is still authoritative for Orthodox Jews today. Um, I don't uh, I don't think they study the part about women in Ida not going into synagogues, but it's, uh, you know, that's that disadvantaged women greatly is when you have, um, when you have arguments about women doing time-bound positive mitzvot in the Talmud, there's, um, I can't remember the two rabbis. One of them is, is uh, I think, Rav Judah, and the other, who's always arguing with him, mm -hmm. is his usual argument. So the two of them argue about all of this, and they're never resolved. It's like, if you're a follower of Rav Judah, then, you, then women get to do all this stuff. And if you're the follower of the other Rav, then, then they don't. But of course, when they put it into the code, they cut out uh, the, the lenient opinions. And there's one place where I found specifically a miscalculate, a mistranslation, which I'm sure is deliberate, mm. in the, um, let's see, oh, in Tractate, oh, yeah, Tractate Rosh Hashanah, um, page 33a, they're talking about women blowing the shofar. Is this permitted? And the Mishnah starts out that, uh, you know, children um, who are normally not um, required to do any mitzvot, they can, they can blow the shofar because they need to learn how. And in the, immediately after the Mishnah, there's this, the two words, nashim, Asur. Okay, there's there's no punctuation. Which in Hebrew in means woman and then for forbidden, just for listening. Yeah, women, women forbidden. And the tra the translations, once you put in punctuation, have this as a sentence where it's very obvious from what comes next that it's a question because it says women and children. Um, may do this if uh, if they're qualified. I mean, women reading Torah, you, you have to be able to to read Hebrew and and not be embarrassed to speak in public. But every single English translation that I've seen of the Talmud <clears throat> has women are forbidden to to blow the shofar. This. And, but then, instead of with a question mark, are women forbidden? Which there's no, um, uh, 
you can't, you know, there's the point, you don't have the punctuation and you don't have the verbs. You don't have a, you know, verb for is or was. So all you can say is women, you know, a sewer shofar. Yeah. Well, that clearly isn't, uh, you know, they're saying, oh, you can float if you want. And nowadays women do. Interesting. Yeah, no, so just to, just to zoom out a little bit, this is a, this is something that I find- Which is why I stuck Rashi's daughters blowing the shofar. Mm. I mean, they, they did, they really did raise sheep. They, um, yep. I, I went, um, my daughter did her junior year abroad in France and I took her t to it, to France with me to look at all the Rashi places and, and she did. And, and we've in Ramaru where Rabbeinu Tom lived, and where he had his yeshiva, it's there. I mean, actually, there's stuff in Twa also that's there. But you could actually see, like, I don't know when exactly a bunch of Jews bought the land and the buildings on it to come out, you know, to keep it for hist history. So you could go there, you can see where they actually lived. There's was the yeshiva. Um, and I encourage people to to do that. Uh, the city of Troyes is very proud of its medieval scholars, Christian and Jewish. There's a Rashi walking path that takes you. It still looks like medieval times. They they, they have a, not zoning, but uh, how, you, how you build your house, it has to look on the outside like it's the 12th century. So right. the streets are cobblestone in the old city. They still have the walls. Inside, modern plumbing, everything. Outside, you're walking around and it's it's the 12th century. Yeah, so for just for, for listeners who are interested, this this debate, this wider Jewish debate between legal codes versus non-legal codes is probably one, one of my favorite. I spend actually almost an entire class session in the uh, Intro to Jewish Text class at UC Irvine that I teach about this because, of course, huge debate about, right, the Talmud preserves two to three opinions on everything, and if you reduce the discussions of the Talmud to binary Jewish law, right, you lose a lot of the back and forth and multiplicity. And so, you know, the uh, Tosafists who we've kept alluding to, they were a uh, school of thought really made up of most of Rashi's uh, sons and grandsons that really wanted <laughs> to dissect and understand the Talmud. They were also pretty against the uh, legal codification of Jewish law, whereas down south in Spain, you had Maimonides, which of course, you know, started a wider trend of actually trying to uh, codify law. Um, with, with, without going too much on a tangent, I want to bring us back. Um, I know that our time is is coming short here. What else have we not discussed? What other topics about Rashi's Daughters, the book, the research, any other book projects you might be um, working on or have written? What else would you like to uh, let our listeners know? Oh, <clears throat> I am writing another book but that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm not going to, you know, tempt the evil eye. Amazing. And if you want to know a lot more about the evil eye and uh, the, um, I don't call it superstition. I call, you know, it's, it's sorcery or sometimes it's just healing spells that the women were doing and women were doing it in Talmudic times, which, which we know from the Talmud. And we also know because we have um, artifacts, um, amulets and incantation bowls, which have survived from that time period. And they're written in Hebrew and they quote Mishnah, they quote Torah a lot. Um, and they're trying to, you know, what do they know about healing? They, uh, you know, they have to get rid of the demons that have caused it or the evil eye or curses. And you know, when I talk about the Rob Pistis book series, um, my my audiences who are predominantly Jewish women and certainly always Jews, I don't have to tell them what a demon, the evil eye, or a curse is. They they all know that, hmm. and they didn't know. And it was Jewish women that were, you know, in the in the Torah it says you shall not let a sorceress. The, the, the Hebrew is very convoluted, what exactly? But anyway, uh, you shouldn't let a, a a sorceress live, and that's I think a mishpatim. And then there's there's another one that uh, that we read. 
in the twice it, it talks about sorcery always in the feminine mm -hmm. and the, the rabbis ask why are the sorceresses always why do they say sorceresses why do they and they they admit because sorcery is the province of women but in the talmud you have plenty of rabbis who are casting spells who are writing amulets they tell you how to write a a legal one that you could wear on shabbat because the amulets are bracelets or around your neck you, to keep you protected all the time Although apparently the most popular amulet was one to win at chariot races. Hmm. Uh, they found them in the, the you know, where they've, they've excavated the stadiums in. Uh, and so women have always had this province of healing and how to say, how to keep the demons away or curse somebody, you know, both of them was uh, something that women did. And even even through now, uh, my my daughter-in-law is um, is from her family came from Iraq. They lived in uh, Baghdad, and her grand I inter talked to her grandmother who uh, was still alive back then, and her grandmother said, "Yeah, her and 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 things." And we're talking twentieth century. They were they were still doing that. And we know about all these because they've dug up like 10,000s at least of these bowls and amulets. The, the amulets written in paper, of course, their leather didn't survive, but they were metal ones, but the bowls. Anyway, so the names of angels, uh, you know, Jewish angels are on these bowls. They're, the women who wrote them were clearly learned. And that is Rav Hizda's daughter. I make her one of these. Um, sorceresses, although the first one is apprentice, she's got to learn how to do it. And then the second one for people who want to know about Jewish women, about what Jewish women's lives were like in the community of rabbis that wrote the Talmud. That's the, that's the community because I was, of course, very curious, like, okay, you, you obviously have women there. Um, and I chose Rav Hizda's daughter. Well, partly she's the, you know, she's the daughter of one of the prime scholars of that time period but there's a little scene in the in the talmud where she's maybe nine or ten years old and there weren't yeshivas back then the rabbis taught in their living room just like rashi did and the students would come to learn jewish law and in talmudic times they learned jewish law because the Jewish community had its own laws. They had the Exilarch, they had their own king. The, the Cyrus the Great was the great for a good reason. He, he conquered the people and he said, okay, you pay taxes to me, my army will protect you, but you, got, you do your own thing. I'm not gonna interfere in you running your own uh, community. So we have a Jewish king uh, through, through this time. Anyway, so she's in the classroom or the living room and Rosh, and Rav Hizda calls her up in, in front of the class and asks her, and he calls up his two best students, Rava and Rami Barhama. For the people who are listening to this, Rava is the Moses of the Talmud. He's mentioned over 4,000 times. His decisions are still halakha now in many cases. Anyway, he calls up Rava and he calls up uh, Rami Barhama and you can see by the arguments in the Talmud that they hate each other when, they, uh, when they're having disagreements. Anyway, he asks his daughter, who do you want to marry? In front of the whole class, and the two guys are standing there. And she says, both of them. And then the Talmud tells us that's exactly what happened. First, she married the older one. And then uh, she was widowed. And then she married Rava. And I thought, okay, I can't pass up that. <laughs> you know, a woman with two husbands, um, one of whom is the greatest Talmudic scholar of ever. And, and I also realized I've been studying Talmud for how many decades, and I know nothing about the women in that community. Mm, yeah. And surely in the Talmud, I can find that. You know what I mean? There's a whole tract of Talmud called Kalim about vessels. There it is, there's your kitchen. And yep. how they did everything with it. I didn't need that's uh, 
So anyway, that's that's the series that came after uh, Rashi's Daughters. Unfortunately, um, I didn't, you know, the, the editor that I had at Penguin for the Rashi's Daughters left and I got a new editor. I mean, they assigned me a new editor who really wasn't very enthusiastic about Rob Hizda, but I had already signed a contract for it before my earlier editor left. So they didn't support it much and you'll rarely find it in a bookstore even these days, mm. which annoys me greatly. But that's life in the book world. Yes, well, just to wrap up, I, I just wanted to thank oh, you yes. so much for coming on to the podcast and uh, readers should definitely look at both the Rashi's Daughters and Rafkiz's Daughters book series. Maggie Anton, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much. And my cat never came in and... <laughs> Join Grammy-winning Pacific Coral on October 7th for a spectacular evening of music and film at Cedar Storm Center for the Arts in Costa Mesa. Experience Richard Ironhorn's evocative Voices of Light, sung live with an orchestra to the silent film The Passion of Joan of Arc, considered by many one of the greatest films ever made. Visit pacificchoral.org to learn more.